name is Obiora Ike, and I serve in the capacity of Executive Director of Globe Ethics Net with headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. Now we run through our introductions. Today's keynote speaker is Meg Stapleton-Smith. Meg is a PhD student in the Theological and Social Ethics program at Fordham University. Her lecture will address how Catholic universities can implement and embody the central teachings of Laudato Si. Though theolo through theological reflection of Laudato Si, as well as critical analysis of sustainability efforts already in place at Jesuit universities, this paper responds to the following questions. What would the structure of a Catholic university look like if it took global climate change seriously? How do we calibrate our universities toward the global common good? In the absence of leadership from Washington on climate change, how does the mission and task of a Catholic university change? How do students across disciplines work towards liberation for the oppressed and for the planet? Ladies and gentlemen, Globe Ethics is proud to present Meg Stapleton-Smith. And that is your cue to start speaking. Well, you don't want to start your PowerPoint yet. You want to just start speaking so that we have you in video. So you want to turn your PowerPoint off. <laughs> You're, we're seeing your PowerPoint. Well, on Zoom, I see your PowerPoint full screen and your video in a small box in the corner. But the people on Facebook, all they can see is your PowerPoint. So start your lecture with the PowerPoint turned off so that people can see you make your introduction, introductory remarks in full video. And then, and then, and then share your screen. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh no, no problem. No problem. No problem. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, take it from the top, top of the intro. Today's keynote speaker is Meg Stapleton-Smith. Meg is a PhD student in the Theological and Social Ethics program at Fordham University. Her lecture will address how Catholic universities can implement and embody the central teachings of Laudato Si. Through theological reflection of Laudato Si, as well as critical analysis of sustainability efforts already in place at Jesuit universities, this paper responds to the following questions. What would the structure of a Catholic university look like if it took global climate change seriously? How do we calibrate our universities toward the global common good? In the absence of leadership from Washington on climate change, how does the mission and task of a Catholic university change? How do students across disciplines work towards liberation for the oppressed and for the planet? Ladies and gentlemen, Globe Ethics is proud to present Meg Stapleton-Smith. Before 
I begin, I'd like to uh, offer a, a note of gratitude to the people at Globe Ethics and uh, Catholic Internet Television for hosting this forum on Laudato Si. Um, and I'd also like to offer a special word of gratitude to uh, Dr. Christiana Zenner and uh, Dr. Elizabeth Johnson for their help in this project. The following paper offers a particular lens for how we ought to respond to the perfect moral storm created by the Anthropocene, which overwhelms our capacity for authentic and integrated moral agency. I argue that in order to combat ecological complacency and environmental chronic irresponsibility, we need faith-based in order to combat education. ecological complacency. Ecological education rooted in faith is, faith according to Pope Francis, what will bring about the ecological conversion we need to save our common home. Ultimately, the goal of this paper is to demonstrate why Catholic colleges and universities should be at the forefront of environmental sustainability and how they can create a culture in which to combat the ecological crisis. In order to explicate this central thesis, this paper will be broken into three parts. I begin by discussing the ways in which the current crisis in higher education demands that universities redefine their mission in light of what is most central and unique to their institution. Interpreting the papal document, Ex Corde Ecclesia, the second part of this paper argues that the distinguishing character of Catholic universities is that its mission is born from the heart of the people of God, and that as an institution, it exists within the people of God. I augment this claim by arguing that Catholic universities live out these guiding precepts by responding to the reality of the damaged humanum. The negative contrast experiences of the damaged humanum is ultimately what ought to define the mission of a Catholic university. If we take this claim seriously, I suggest, then the ecological crisis should be the paramount concern of Catholic colleges and universities. As such, in the third part of the paper, I offer a reading of Pope Francis's articulation of ecological education in Laudato Si, and offer ways in which Catholic colleges and universities can form ecological citizens for the future of our common home. The landscape of higher education in America is dramatically shifting. Escalating tuition prices and declining student enrollment are only some of the problems that colleges and universities are facing. The cost of tuition to attend an American college has increased nearly 400% in the last 30 years. As enrollment continues to decline and the price tag of a university education continues to increase, many colleges are being forced to shut their doors. The elite institutions that are able to keep their doors open are doing so by asking students to pay up to $275,000 for a four-year education. The current crisis in higher education, characterized by escalating tuition prices and declining student enrollment, cannot go on much longer. As George Keller writes, a specter is haunting higher education, the specter of decline and bankruptcy. Some compare the reality of higher education to a soap bubble, destined to burst. This is to imply that tuition prices simply cannot continue to rise at this rate. Once they reach a price tag that is too high to withstand, the bubble will burst and inevitably even out tuition prices. Others refer to the current crisis in higher education as a water balloon with a hole in it, slowly leaking water until it becomes empty. This suggests that the crisis in education is not even about high tuition prices or declining student enrollment. Rather, the core of the crisis is that the value of a degree education in higher education is not even will about high significant or declining student enrollment. Unable to pay the price of a college degree, students will find other means of educating themselves and their communities. Whichever metaphor you choose, it is clear that the current model of higher education is unsustainable. While a handful of universities across the United States of America can use their endowments as a safety net, 
The rest of universities are wondering how to keep up in an ethos of profit or perish. If it is true that the bubble will burst, that tuition prices of all colleges and universities will roughly cost the same in the future, how will colleges and universities distinguish themselves from one another? Will educational institutions be reduced to a question of who provides the best return on an investment? And if so, how will universities differentiate their return? Beyond questions about what financial practices and educational tactics will be sustainable in the, for universities in the future, lays a crisis of identity. In other words, the specter of decline and bankruptcy that is currently haunting institutions of higher education is forcing universities to redefine and re-envision themselves. One group of colleges and universities that are acutely experiencing this identity crisis are Catholic institutions. This is principally because these universities have an explicit historical identity and articulated mission rooted in religious conviction. The mission statement of a Catholic college is not merely to form a rigorous intellectual community dedicated to critical thinking, though that is of course part of it. Beyond this, the mission statements of Catholic universities entail within them a commitment to the gospel. Certainly Catholic universities are challenged by what all institutions of higher education are facing, how to survive financially in the future. And yet Catholic colleges have a dimension to their fiscal, fiscal planning that secular universities do not. That is, Catholic schools must question how their strategies can be integrated into a mission with a religious identity. Thus, university administrators are forced to ask how financial strategies for growth will fit with the university's commitments as a religiously affiliated institution. How ought Catholic colleges and universities sustain their institution's religious legacy and enhance it for the future? This is the very tension that compelled Pope John Paul II to write on the religious identity that lies at the heart of Catholic colleges and universities. In 1990, Pope John Paul II published the Apostolic Constitution on Catholic Universities, Ex Corde Ecclesia. This document addresses topics such as the role of theology in the Catholic University vis-a-vis -vis the magisterium, the relationship of the university to the local bishop, and the distinctive character of a Catholic university. Rather than outlining the specific content of the document, I would like to use the work of feminist theologian, Catherine Maury Lacuna to help us explicate the two central and unique claims of the document, that the Catholic university is born ex corde ecclesia, from the heart of the people of God, from the heart of the church, and that the Catholic university is in the church. When Pope John Paul II claims that the Catholic University is born ex corde ecclesia, from the heart of the church, he is making a claim about the way the Catholic University both participates in and activates the mission of the church. As Lacuna rightly points out, to claim that the Catholic University is born ex corde ecclesia means that the unique vocation, characteristics, and tasks of a Catholic University and the particular way it pursues its commitment to research and teaching are means by which the church preaches the gospel. As a university, the Catholic university must be dedicated to scholarship that, quote, confronts the great problems of society and culture. But as a Catholic university, all scholarship, teaching, and education are in service to the message of the gospel. In fact, according to Pope John Paul II, all of the university's affairs and activities are in service of the church. Further, the Catholic university is essential to the church's mission for evangelization in that it assists the church in the pursuit of truth and enables the church to initiate critical dialogue. We are unaccustomed to thinking that the Catholic university is born from the heart of the church and that the ultimate responsibility of the university is to serve the church and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lacuna makes a poignant observation here about what it means to understand the university as being born ex corde ecclesia. The critical point Lacuna suggests is how we understand the word church. When interpreting the document from one perspective, 
the word church appears synonymous with the hierarchical magisterium. Yet Lacuna reminds us that the church is the whole people of God, all members of the body of Christ. If we only interpret the word church as the hierarchy, then we risk overlooking the most significant contribution of the document. That is, the university is born out of the heart of the people of God. This analysis can be extended to interpret one of the more controversial paragraphs of the document where Pope John Paul II claims that the university is in the church. See slide for this quote. Many were troubled by this particular passage, assuming the central implication was that the magisterium has ultimate jurisdiction over the Catholic university. Following Lacuna, we can challenge this narrow interpretation. To claim that the university is in the church ought not mean that the magisterium has absolute authority over university matters. If we understand the word church in a way that is more in line with contemporary theology and ecclesiology as the people of God, then to claim that the university is in the church means that the university exists, dwells, and abides within the people of God. If we interpret the word church as the people of God, rather than the hierarchical magisterium, then we can elicit two central claims from Ex Corde Ecclesia about the unique character of a Catholic university. First, the university is born Ex Corde Ecclesia, from the heart of the people of God. In other words, all university affairs, its mission, its research, its teaching, its governing systems, must be born out of the desires, the needs, and the suffering of humanity. Second, the university is within or among the people of God. As such, the ultimate task of the university is to immerse itself within humanity, the people of God. This helpfully reframes how Catholic universities ought to distinguish themselves as they move forward into the future. The character of a Catholic university as Christian is not merely its relationship to the magisterium. Rather, it is the Catholic university's commitment to the people of God. Thus, the connection between social justice work and the life of faith is an essential distinguishing feature of a Catholic university. The bedrock of Catholicism, its beliefs, its values, norms, and shared assumptions, compel individuals to work for justice. Certainly, if the university is to understand itself as being born from the heart of the people of God and within or among the people of God, then service and social justice work are indispensable aspects for how the university carries out its mission. There cannot be an explicit commitment to the people of God without a commitment to eradicate the forms of oppression that marginalize certain members of Christ's body. The call to place a commitment to social justice that is rooted in faith at the epicenter of a Catholic university is not an entirely new notion. We can look to the work of liberation theologian John Sabrino as an example of a thinker who has sought to articulate the mission of the Catholic university in light of a commitment to the people of God. In an article exploring whether a Christian university is really possible, Sabrino argues that a university's identity is not established by merely stating that it is nominally Christian. So too is a university's identity as Christian, not simply created by virtue of its commitment to education, its Christian formation of students, or even the existence of theology departments. Rather, a Christian university forms its identity from being at the service of the kingdom of God and making a preferential option for the poor. Sabrino contends that because a university is incarnated in a social reality that gives it power, economic, political, and religious power, it can easily become disincarnate from the reality of the majority of the world, which is poor and oppressed. When a Christian university becomes disconnected from the reality of the oppressed, according to Sabrino, it loses what makes it Christian. The central concern of a Catholic university is thus not to defend the truth accepted a priori, but rather to help society grow in the direction of the kingdom of God. 
educational institutions, Sabrina argues, can fail to form students against the horizon of social realities. And, and as a result, produce graduates who reinforce the systems that disadvantage the poor. As such, the measure of a Christian university is not religious practice, but service towards a more just human society. In light of this, Sabrino articulates two guiding principles for a Christian university. First, the kingdom of God should function as horizon and finality for the university's endeavors. Second, the university must implement an option for the poor that finds ways to bring the world of the poor into the university and lets the poor become a place for discerning God's active presence in the world. There are three key precepts that we can elicit from the thought of Sobrino about the unique identity of a Catholic university and its mission to be born ex corde ecclesia and to situate itself among the people of God. First, the Catholic university must be incarnate in the reality of those who are oppressed and resist the forces, namely consumerism and individualism, that allow the university to become disincarnate from this reality. This augments with greater specificity the call issued by Ex Corde Ecclesia for a university to be in the people of God. Second, following the message of the gospel, the Catholic university must emphatically combat injustice and the structures of sin that perpetuate that injustice. Third, the kingdom of God should be the utopian vision that draws the Catholic university onward in its central religious convictions. As liberation theologian Gustavo Gutierrez contends, Jesus's announcement of the kingdom, quote, reveals to society itself the aspiration for a just society and leads it to discover unsuspected dimensions and unexplored paths. In other words, the kingdom of God is the Christian utopian vision, which reveals the glimmering of a just, loving and egalitarian society in the midst of humanity's suffering. And so, the kingdom of God reveals to Catholic universities their fundamental identity as Christian. Catholic universities are not merely seeking to produce students who can make a valuable contribution to society. Catholic universities should be seeking to produce students whose lives will serve the kingdom of God. In order to further draw out what it means for the Catholic university to be incarnate in the reality of the oppressed, to combat sinful social structures, and to have the kingdom of God as a guiding vision, we can look to the work of theologian Edward Skilovex. The starting point for ethical obligation, according to Skilovex, is not some pre-existing divine natural order, but rather the damaged humanum or damaged humanity. Those moments where we acutely experience a threat to the humanum are negative experiences of contrast. Skilobex identifies negative contrast experiences as those experiences where we suddenly say, this should not and must not go on. Experiences such as global poverty, racism, and war. In other words, negative contrast experiences begin with individual or communal awareness of evil and suffering. According to Skilobex, in order to even recognize suffering as evil, that cannot and should not go on as a negative experience, we must experience them in contrast with something else, something which is positive and good. For Skilobex, it is the vision of the kingdom of God which ignites our indignation over human suffering. And so, although the humanum remains threatened, liberative currents are made manifest in the human refusal to acquiesce to these situations of suffering and oppression. It is difficult to shake off the impression that in our current historical moment, the greatest threat to the humanum is the ecological crisis, manifested in environmental degradation and the breakdown of social relationships. In the epilogue of his book, Church, Skilobex reflects on environmental issues and even refers in this context to the notion of ecological contrast experiences. As such, Skilobex widens the focus of negative contrast experiences by no longer solely concentrating on the threatened humana, but also that of threatened creation. 
skill of X, even criticizes humanity for its tendency to forget that it shares one creation with inorganic and organic creatures. Before proceeding to the third and final section of this paper, let us briefly recapitulate the central points that have been articulated thus far. We established the need for Catholic universities to re-examine their mission in light of their unique religious identity. Following Catherine Lacuna's interpretation of Ex Corde Ecclesia, we concluded that the essential distinguishing feature of a Catholic university, what gives it its fundamental identity, is that it is born from the heart of the people of God and that it is within the people of God. We explored these two precepts further by pointing to John Sabrina, who has demonstrated the unique call of a Catholic university to be incarnate in the reality of the oppressed, to combat structures of sin that perpetuate injustice, and to root itself in the vision of the kingdom. Finally, we look to the work of Edward Skillabex in order to more fully understand what it means to be incarnate in the reality of suffering. Such experiences, we concluded, cannot be limited to the damaged humanum or the damaged humanity, but rather must be extended to include damaged creation. When held in contrast to the vision of the kingdom, the reality of suffering creation ought to reveal the demand for ecological praxis. When extending the significance of these thinkers to the complex reality of higher education, we may draw the following conclusion. If the Catholic university is to understand itself as being born ex corde ecclesia and situated among the people of God, then it must constantly hold in tension the suffering of all creation with the central convictions of our faith that demand we combat and seek to ameliorate that suffering. How the university responds to the suffering of creation, how it responds to ecological contrast experiences, reveal the university's identity as Catholic. In other words, what the Catholic university values is revealed in its very response to the concreteness of creation suffering. On January 1st, 1990, Pope John Paul II published a document entitled, Peace with God the Creator, Peace with All Creation. At the outset of the text, he writes, in our day there is a growing awareness that world peace is threatened not only by the arms race, regional conflicts, and continued injustices among the peoples and nations, but also by a lack of due respect for nature, by the plundering of natural resources and a progressive decline in the quality of life. He continues, moreover, a new ecological awareness is beginning to emerge, which rather than being downplayed, ought to be encouraged to develop into concrete programs and initiatives. And so he concludes this document commemorating World Peace Day by writing, an education and ecological responsibility is urgent. Responsibility for oneself, for others, and for the earth. 26 years after the publication of Peace with God the Creator, Peace with All Creation, Pope Francis picks up the trajectory of ecological education started by Pope John Paul II and develops it with an increased sense of moral urgency. Pope Francis writes in the beginning of Laudato Si, if present trends continued, the century may well witness extraordinary climate change and unprecedented destruction of the ecosystem with serious consequences for all of us. This echoes the warning of Stephen Mulkey, quote, it is likely that we have only about a decade to take sustainability seriously, or we will lose the window of opportunity to salvage a livable planet for our children and grandchildren. Humanity faces a central choice, live more sustainably on this planet or face consequences that are incompatible with civilization. The choice really is that stark. In light of the grave reality of the Anthropocene, Pope Francis asks, can humans turn from being masters, consumers, and ruthless exploiters to feeling, quote, intimately united with all that exists? What will be revealed in our response to ecological contrast experiences? Moreover, does Catholic ecological education have the ability to create this necessary conversion 
so that we may save our common home. In what follows, I will note four key aspects that characterize Pope Francis's vision for ecological education. The first and most fundamental facet of ecological education is that it must be rooted in the signs of the times, the distinctive characteristics of the contemporary age. At first glance, this may seem like an obvious contribution. After all, Laudato Si is an encyclical offering an analysis of what Pope Francis considers to be the gravest moral issue that we face today. Although Pope Francis does not mention the phrase signs of the times in his section on ecological education, in fact, he does not mention the phrase in the entire document. The way Francis situates his conversation on ecological education is methodologically significant for his precept of Catholic, for this precept of Catholic social teaching. In the preceding paragraph to his section on ecological education, Francis calls for an open dialogue between religion and sciences. He writes, quote, the gravity of the ecological crisis demands that we all look to the common good embarking on a path of dialogue which demands patience, self-discipline, and generosity, always keeping in mind that, quote, realities are greater than ideas. Here, I'll direct you to the quote on your slide where Pope Francis is quoting from his own apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, in which he writes under a section titled, realities are more important than ideas. There are two noteworthy premises for ecological education that flow from this. First, the mission of a Catholic university must re-envision its ecological location. Earlier in the paper we discussed, following Ex Corde Ecclesia, that the mission of a Catholic university is born from the heart of the people of God, and that the Catholic university is within or among the people of God. Looking to the thought of Sabrino, we extended this to suggest that the Catholic university must be incarnate in the reality of those who are oppressed, must emphatically combat injustice and the structures of sin that perpetuate injustice, and must place the kingdom of God as the utopian vision that draws the Catholic university onward in its central religious convictions. In its practical impl implementation, this means that the mission of the university must always begin with the reality of suffering negative contrast experiences and ecological contrast experiences, and strategize how the mission of the university can alleviate that suffering through the work of justice. In light of Pope Francis, we may further suggest that the mission of a Catholic university is born from the heart of the ecosystem and that it must understand itself as situated within the created world. If reality is paramount for determining prudential moral action within the Anthropocene, then colleges and universities need to reinterpret their position within that reality in light of the ecological crisis. Given this, there is a call for the institutions of Catholic higher education to imagine themselves as an ecosystem within the larger schema of creation. To be sure, universities do not exist abstractly from the environment in which they are situated. Immersing itself more deeply into the reality of the ecosystem is the first step for Catholic colleges and universities to take in forming a new vision for ecological education. The second premise that follows from this methodological shift is that ecological education demands ecological praxis. For the university to immerse itself in the ecological reality is at once a willingness to be transformed by it and a commitment to help protect it. Flowing from the central conviction that ecological education must immerse itself in the ecological reality and that the content of our education must be guided by that reality is a call for environmental education to create a new covenant between humanity and the natural world. This begins by inst institutions for education grounding themselves in the ecological reality so that they may become more attuned to the groaning of creation and respond to that suffering accordingly. The form of ecological education that follows from engaging with reality, according to Pope Francis, must include a radical critique of the dominant cultural paradigms that guide our contemporary society. And we might extend that guide our vision of higher education. 
namely rampant individualism and a mechanistic vision of the natural world. For Pope Francis, the new ecological culture needed to care for our common home, quote, cannot be reduced to a series of urgent and practical responses to the immediate problems of pollution, environmental decay, and the depletion of natural resources. The changes required are much wider and far reaching. Quote, we need to develop a new synthesis capable of overcoming the false arguments of recent centuries. I'll direct you again to the quote that is on your slide. It is here that Pope Francis notes how environmental education has broadened its goals. He writes, quote, whereas in the beginning it was mainly centered on scientific information, consciousness raising, and prevention of environmental risk, environmental education tends now to include a critique of the myths of modernity grounded in a utilitarian mindset. Individualism, unlimited progress, competition, consumerism, and the unregulated market. In other words, ecological education cannot merely be about the individual acts that tend to assuage the conscience of the privilege, like riding one's bike occasionally, recycling, turning off the faucet when brushing one's teeth. Ecological education must be rooted in a sustained critique of the individualistic mindset that is both harming our environment and our social relationships. This is a crucial point in Francis's vision for ecological education. That is, in order to ameliorate the harm we have caused to the environment and prevent future wrongdoing, we need to assess and interpret the role of Christian discipleship and offer moral guidance without reinscribing the hegemonic forms of oppression that fostered human exploitation of environmental resources in the first place. Ecological education should prudently and scrupulously examine the roots of human injustices towards the environment in order to inform ethical responses to the Anthropocene. Without positing this task at the forefront of ecological education, we risk furthering the presence of domination that lays beneath our current posture towards the environment. As Elizabeth Johnson notes in her recent work, The Cross and Creation, quote, domination as domination has largely erased the community of creation from consciousness, opening the door to unbridled exploitation of nature without ecclesial protest. And so our effort to educate ecologically will be in vain if it does not entail an analysis of and subsequent pragmatic action against the forms of domination that lay at the intersection of human ecology and environmental ecology. In other words, our attempts to help the environment and to fix the ecological crisis will be utterly ineffective if they are not sustained by a form of education that challenges the individualistic mindset that is so pervasive in our modern world today. As Pope Francis writes, our efforts at education will be inadequate and ineffective unless we strive to promote a new way of thinking about human beings, life, society, and our relationship with nature. The forces of domination that work to oppress both humans and the environment, we might suggest, are deeply interconnected. After all, the true efficacy of ecological education is that we might understand that the forces of domination that harm the marginalized are interconnected with the forces of domination that harm the earth. We seek to understand this connection so that we might erase the structures of sin that contribute to this oppression and bring the entirety of creation to the fullness of its flourishing. The colleges and universities which form a part of the Catholic network of higher education are not exempt from this radical critique of individualism and domination. In fact, it is essential to discover the ways in which colleges and universities in particular contribute to environmental degradation rather than ameliorate it. Given the damage we have already caused and are continuing to inflict upon our common home, as well as the increasing breakdown of social relationships we are faced with an educational challenge. 
The question that remains is whether or not universities are contributing to the current milieu of extreme consumerism and affluence that reinforce humanity's harmful posture to the environment. As C.A. Bowers and David Orr have noted, most of our current educational systems are based on this very individualism and anthropocentrism. Modern anthropocentrism subtly permeates curricula in most parts of the world. Moreover, David Orr points out that the ecological crisis is mainly caused by some of the best educated people in society. According to Orr, the main focus of current educational curricula sets economic growth as the highest achievement of success and thus only prepares students to compete in the world economy. This is precisely the vision of education that Pope Francis is critiquing. Pope Francis writes, quote, disinterested concern for others and the rejection of every form of self-centeredness and self-absorption are essential if we truly wish to care for our brothers and sisters and for the natural environment. These attitudes also attune us to the moral imperative of assessing the impact of our every action and personal decision on the world around us. If we are to truly overcome individualism and the ways in which it negatively manifests itself in our degradation of the environment, then we need educational leadership that dares to scrutinize its own method of educating. We need a model of educational leadership that risks understanding itself as a force of domination that contributes to the individualistic and materialistic society of which we are a part so that it might be able to offer a counter narrative that is rooted in faith and justice. One of the most intriguing and often overlooked aspects of Pope Francis's discussion of ecological education is the language of virtue. Francis is not the first Pope to employ the language of virtue in an encyclical. We can think here of Pope John Paul II's articulation of solidarity as a virtue in Solicitudo Rei Socialis. Francis contends that ecological education needs to instill good habits. Only by cultivating sound virtues, Francis argues, will people be able to make a selfless ecological commitment. Using the language of virtue here is intentional, for the language of virtue is bound up in the language of human flourishing. Ecological education for Francis must be rooted in virtue because it is a necessary part of full and authentic human flourishing. Francis does not give an explicit definition of virtue in the encyclical or fully explicate its connection to human flourishing in an ecological sense. However, we might come to understand Francis's use of virtue in the encyclical in light of how St. Maximus understands virtue. For St. Maximus, communion with God is simultaneous to the acquisition of virtue. Virtue is embodied deification. The human is created to learn how to love, and this exists in constant tension against that which weakens our capacity to love, to love. We understand virtue not as building of character for character's sake, but as enabling the human capacity to love. It is a wiring of the self as openness to love. St. Maximus says in his 400 chapters on love, all the virtues assist the mind in the pursuit of divine love. Moreover, Saint Max, for St. Maximus, love is not a mode we strive for individually, but communally. For St. Max, Maximus, the confessor offers us a key conceptual point on the into the necessity of virtue for ecological education. That is, we should desire to be formed by ecological education, not out of duty or obligation, but as something that enables our human capacity for love and human flourishing. St. Maximus's definition of virtue also elicits a powerful tension that contemporary Christians continue to face today. When we consider, together with Pope Francis and sociologist Robert Bella, that, quote, individualism lies at the very core of American culture, we note that what we love and desire are societally driven towards material possessions, wealth, and prestige rather than understanding our interconnectedness with all of creation. The tendency towards individualism and materialism thus stands in direct contrast to the web of right relationship that Francis is calling us to in his vision of integral ecology. The willingness to develop ecological virtues is thus a willingness to relinquish those things that society 
tells us to love. Money, power, and security. As such, Francis employs the language of virtue as a means to suggest that ecological education demands a reordering of our desires. Beyond what is right or wrong and beyond what is good or bad lays Francis's ethical conviction that in order to care for our common home, we must reorder our desires so that we may enhance our capacity for ecologically sustainable relationships. Although this is fundamentally a call for <clears throat> individuals to habituate virtuous action, so too is it a call for institutions of higher education to reorder their desires. Pope Francis may agree here with Aristotle that humans are social beings who depend upon the well being of a social collectivity for their own well being. For Aristotle, not just any collectivity will serve the social needs of humans, it is only the good polis that one can become properly trained in virtue, have the right opportunities for its practice, <clears throat> and have others with whom to share the joys of the good life. And so we need colleges and universities to create a culture where ecological virtues might flourish and where students may become ecological citizens. Pope Francis proposes a vision of ecological education that holistically seeks to, quote, restore the various levels of ecological equilibrium, establishing harmony within ourselves, with others, with nature and other living creatures and with God. After all, Laudato Si is an encyclical of relationships, drawing attention to a profound rupture in our relationship with the creator, with one another and with the earth. In the final chapter of his encyclical, Pope Francis proposes a vision of holistic ecological education that educates students to become responsible members of the wider human community and citizens for the bi biotic community. For Francis, holistic ecological education leads to a greater sense of solidarity with the human and non-human animal family, especially with the more vulnerable members of our common home. He writes, quote, ecological education needs educators capable of developing an ethics of ecology and helping people through effective pedagogy to grow in solidarity, responsibility, and compassionate care. There is a need, as Elizabeth Johnson notes, to quote, reimagine ourselves as a species. Mirroring Pope Francis here, Johnson continues, quote, certainly we are distinct from other species, as indeed they are from each other, but we are also kin. We have magnified the distinction and forgotten the kingship. If we reimagine ourselves as part of God's good creation, then we could grow in a new way of being human that enhances rather than diminishes the life of other creatures. Ecological education is complete only when it succeeds in inculcating a profound sense that we are interconnected with all of creation. The measure of ecological education is its ability to produce ecological citizens who see themselves as interconnected with all of creation and engage in direct forms of ecological praxis because of that kinship. We are left with one final question. What is the task of the Catholic University in light of the current ecological crisis? If we take seriously Pope Francis's vision for ecological education, if we let our convictions be informed by the ecological reality, if we radically critique societal paradigms of domination, and if we ecologically envision our educational institutions as being in kinship with the created order so that they may embody a culture where ecological virtues may flourish, then we will be venturing into uncharted territory. As a result of this, we need educational leadership from Catholic colleges and universities that are willing to embody the virtue of courage. In other words, in the words of Pope Francis, we need to, we need leadership that will quote, facilitate making the leap towards the transcendent, which gives ecological ethics its deepest meaning. In the final chapter of the encyclical, Pope Francis quotes the courageous challenge promulgated by the Earth Charter. Quote, as never before in history, common destiny beckons us to seek a new beginning. Let ours be a time remembered for the awakening of a new reverence for life, 
the firm resolved to achieve sustainability, the quickening of the struggle for justice and peace, and the joyful celebration of life. Ultimately, Pope Francis's vision is calling us to understand that ecological education is a courageous challenge, which demands that we, as a moral community, move forward into an unknown future. Courage will be critical, especially for those Catholic colleges and universities seeking to form ecological citizens for our common home. If Catholic universities of higher education truly let their educational vision be guided by the ecological reality, then they need to have the courage to risk abandoning familiar but unworkable theological and ethical categories that have perpetuated harm to the living earth. As Martha Nussbaum argues in her work, The Fragility of Goodness, though human life is inherently exposed to harm, there are certain powers, namely human virtues, that are only available in the realm of vulnerability. Drawing on Aristotle's ethics, she posits that the pursuit of human goodness is fundamentally vulnerable, contingent on external goods, and subject to the possibility of demise. The features of human life that expose us to misfortune are precisely those dimensions that are condition that make possible our experiences of love, joy, beauty, and truth. If what we are striving for in ecological ethics is new patterns of relationships, characterized not by domination, but by sustainability, adaptability, relationality, equity, solidarity, biodiversity, and humility, we need to be willing to live in the midst of vulnerability. And we must allow that vulnerability to reorder our desires so that we might learn how to love one another and all of God's creation more intimately. The target audience of this paper is administrators in positions of power at Catholic colleges and universities. And I will conclude by calling attention particularly to those persons. If those involved in mission integration at Catholic institutions for higher education take my analysis seriously, then they will place the ecological crisis at the forefront of their university mission. That is to say, all of the endeavors and affairs of the university will seek God's reign and work for justice in the midst of the ecological crisis. Catholic colleges and universities, as religiously affiliated institutions, are in a unique, are in a unique position to be at the forefront of environmental sustainability. As has been discussed, the deeper sources of the ecological crisis are our modern anthropocentrism and individualism. As Pope Benedict XVI wrote, echoing the concerns of Pope Francis, quote, the brutal consumption of creation begins where God is missing, where matter has become simply material for us, where we ourselves are the ultimate measure, where everything is simply our property. The waste of creation begins where we no longer recognize any claim beyond ourselves. The response to the ecological crisis is not simply environmental solutions and sustainable practices, though these are of course very important, but demands an understanding that God abides in solidarity with all of creation. Should we re-envision all of creation and the divine in such a way, a renewed sense of our interconnectedness to our natural environment will follow. Ultimately, the life of faith holds a perspective on the ecological crisis that is not entailed in secular commitments to the environment. Catholic universities and colleges should be inspired to understand the contribution that their unique religious charism can offer. Implementing Pope Francis's vision for ecological education will not only help secure the fate of our common home, it will also secure the fate of Catholic colleges and universities in this country. As Theodore Hesburgh contends in regard to the future of Catholic colleges and universities, quote, we cannot avoid facing frankly the dangers and difficulties that confront us along the road of present and future development. But neither should we be timid, unimaginative or defensive. In fact, what we need most at this juncture of our history are all the qualities of a pioneer, vision, courage, confidence, great hope inspired by faith and ever revivified by love and direction. In light of Pope Francis's concept of ecological education, I hope this paper has offered such a vision of courage for Catholic colleges and universities as they move forward into the future. It is my firm conviction that Catholic colleges, that Catholic 
ecological education holds the promise to bring about the ecological conversion that we need to save our common home. The task of the Catholic University is to have the courage to build their mission from the heart of the ecosystem, to hear the groaning of creation and to let their educational vision be transformed by that suffering. Thank you. Bravo. I'm gonna ask you to stop sharing your screen and I'll ask you a few questions here. There we go. Yeah, I, Meg, I, I love the perspective that you bring to this discussion, uh, the, the liberation theologians. Uh, I love Guterres and Schillebeck, so I, I'm, uh, uh, and uh, Elizabeth Johnson. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with John Sobrino, so I'm gonna, uh, I got him on my, my reading list. <laughs> The uh, uh, couple of thoughts. Uh, uh, I I quote Pope Francis uh, often. Uh, uh, Reality is greater than ideas, and uh, 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 he does ask us to to uh, look to the signs of the times, uh, and uh, and open that dialogue between the religions and sciences, and. Uh, uh, confront uh, the dominant cultural systems that are creating oppression, uh, which is the liberation perspective. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, and I liked how you incorporated virtue ethics into uh, your presentation. Uh, I recall from history the founding fathers used to have clubs where they'd sit around and talk about the virtues, and uh, uh, we don't do that anymore. Uh, the uh, the ecological crisis uh, uh, really does demand a, a, a fundamental paradigm shift uh, in uh, in how we view our relationships uh, uh, with others with with the environment uh, uh, and uh, the. Uh, the technology, the, the green technologies that are available, uh, uh, not only are, are they distributed and decentralized, but uh, uh, ask us to think about new forms of financial structure. And, uh, and all this is very threatening to the uh, to dominant <laughs> uh, systems. Um, uh, I find the Catholic universities are are doing some marvelous work. Uh, the, the the Catholic Climate Covenant is uh, the association of all the Catholic universities in this country that are uh, attempting to uh, apply the principles of La Dot O C in in, in in the universities. And, and the universities are doing uh, some wonderful work. Uh, the University of Dayton, uh, they were. The, I believe the first Catholic university to divest their billion dollar endowment uh, of uh, carbon extraction industries. And they're placing um, solar panels on the roofs of, bil of their buildings now in uh, a region of the country where it's still a little more expensive to run solar than it is uh, to uh, uh, buy electricity from the utility, although that will be changing in years to come. Uh, the, uh, but still, it was a, a, it, it's a visible sign in Dayton, Ohio, uh, uh, that, that the university is committed. Uh, uh, the, uh, I know uh, professors at the university, uh, uh, a civil engineer uh, who built uh, uh, a house out of straw uh, his house out of straw uh, as a demonstration project, and uh, and the Marianas uh, Monastery is a is a large nature prairie reserve where they teach uh, uh, there's uh, ed ecological education. The uh, uh, but a couple of things are missing uh, in uh, in Catholic higher education uh, that I 
at least uh, from my perspective, uh, an outsider looking in, I don't see. Uh, I, I don't. I don't see the university inviting into the discussion people uh, who are affected by climate change. Uh, uh, in uh, in the Catholic worker, uh, you, you uh, called it negative contrast experience, Shilovex. In, in Catholic worker parlance, we call it a crossing of the bridge experience, uh, uh, bringing the wealthy and the poor together to to see we're all we're all the same, <laughs> and to experience. Uh, uh, so, is that happening at Fordham? Are you are you creating those crossing of the bridge experiences? Fordham, there's certainly. Uh, as you say, crossing of the bridge experiences in regard to um, our community in the Bronx and how we're situated in the Bronx. So there's a lot of good work being done within that community, um, but in terms of, of poverty alleviation, but um, I don't see as much doing it has, I don't see it being done from an ecological perspective. And I think one of the key things that what Francis is drawing us to and what I hoped my analysis would show is that we need to encounter those people, as you say, who are being most gravely affected by environmental degradation. And depending on a university's location, um, I don't think that you need to go very far to see those effects. So I know that there's a couple of universities, one speaking the Jesuit University in the Philippines, that has a program of ecological praxis where all students go through a program to engage with communities that are being most affected by environmental degradation. But as again, as I said, for in my case of Fordham in the Bronx, you don't need to go very far to see that people are suffering from the effects of the environmental crisis. Namely, in our case, there's uh, food deserts that are right in the Bronx. And so access to good, uh, clean and healthy food is something that uh, environmental, the, that the ecological crisis is gravely affecting. So these are all little, th you know, little things. I think that it's really about seeing yourself, as I suggested, as situated within an ecosystem, so that it becomes not just about engaging with the community in the Bronx as a matter of poverty alleviation, but seeing that poverty alleviation is deeply interconnected to saving the future of our common home. I agree. Uh, we had uh, a gentleman from uh, Argentina on the show last week uh, who was organizing children in an area that is subject to desertification. Uh, all the all land is drying up, uh, agriculture is failing, water resources are, are failing, and it's causing extreme poverty. Uh, uh, and we don't see that in, in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, uh, out of sight, out of mind. So, so it is important for us to see that our uh, environmental behavior does uh, affect others, and uh, and to have some degree of of, of empathy uh, as as uh, fellow human beings. The um, the other uh, the other thought, uh, um, and I guess this goes. Uh, to a question of, of uh, liberation pedagogy, I, I don't know if the if that book's been written or if you're writing it. Uh, I uh, I can say this as an outsider. Uh, I don't expect you to to comment, but my experience in working with Catholic universities across the country, the the one bastion of resistance is the business school. They uh, uh, are thoroughly entrenched in. Uh, uh, competition and volunteerism. Uh, sure, uh, we'll we'll do sustainability if it's good for the bottom line, uh, and uh, irrespective of whether uh, the benefits pass to stakeholders or to shareholders. <laughs> uh, and uh, and one of the things that 
Laudato Si just screams for is global governance. Uh, uh, that there is a role for, for good government, for consensus, for rules. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 that this can't be, this can't be voluntary. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, so I'll circle back around. Uh, is there a liberation pedagogy uh, that uh, is uh, being circulated in the universities, or, or, uh, uh, or are you writing the book? There's um, some historically good texts that focus on liberation pedagogy. Probably the most famous is the work of uh, Paulo Freire. And one of the greatest aspects of, of liberative pedagogy as it has been articulated um, and also of liberation theologians in Central America specifically South and also South America, is that it's a, the fundamental thing is that it, it raises one's consciousness or it creates a new awareness of the structures of sin that are at work in the world. And that is liberative because then you begin to see that the forces that oppress are not um, often through one's own faults, but through the work of societal structures of sinfulness. And liberative pedagogy has been, is subtly also permeating the work of many theologians working in the field of ecological theology. And so I can point, for example, to the work of Dr. Elizabeth Johnson, where it's a, there's a raising of consciousness, but it's a new imaginative awareness that first of all demonstrates which forces, which social structures are um, operating in modes of domination that contaminate our e ecosystem and that are uh, continuing to degrade the natural world. And yet there's also an exercise, especially in this comes out a lot in Elizabeth Johnson's uh, most recent work, The Crossing Creation, that is inviting people into an imaginative space as consciousness raising to say, well, what are the ways in which we can see the divine at work in the ecosystem? What are the ways in which the divine permeates the natural world? And does that invite a new form of conversion? This is following a trajectory of many eco-feminists who have seen that if we maybe shift our focus, if we imagine, if we begin to see ourselves as connected to the natural world, theologians like Sally McFaig, who suggested what if we were to see the earth as God's body? Uh, Rosemary Radford Ruther is another example of an ecofeminist in her work Guy and God that has suggested, well, what would it be like to see ourselves, see the divine as permeating within and through the natural world? And would that invite the consciousness raising, the conversion necessary for us to stop our posture of domination towards the natural environment? Amen. <laughs> uh, Meg, uh, any any last thoughts or prayers? Uh, and and thank you, thank you. This was a a, a, a consciousness raising uh, uh, presentation. Well, the, I just would like to say a word of gratitude again uh, to you, Stephen, and to all the people at Catholic Internet Television and Globe Ethics for inviting me to speak and. My prayer is that um, we all will be invited to a specific place of conversion uh, before it is too late. It is truly a changing of the heart that requires faith and prayer uh, in order to move forward into the future. So that is my prayer for myself and for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Meg Stapleton-Smith, uh, our, our next generation of Theologians, thank you. Our uh, next week, please join us. Our, our keynote speakers will be uh, Stuart Wallace and uh, uh, Norman Curland. Stuart Wallace has a long been an advocate for transition to a new economic 